I'm going to bring in Thomas Barker so he can uh, intro all of our first panelists. Thanks for your patience. What up, San Diego? Thank you, thank you. Um, thank you for coming to Shredding the Norm, the overlap between skateboarding and design. I am the hostess with the mostest, Thomas Barker. Um, I'm co-chairman of the board of CSEF. I'm the former executive director of the International Association of Skateboard Companies. I'm a lifelong skateboarder and I've worked in the skateboard industry since I was 12 years old. So I've been around the block. If you know me, you know I love skateboarding and I really like to talk about it. Um, so I'm really excited for this evening. I promise I won't go full Mrs. Maisel on you, but can't guarantee that. Um, first off, I wanna thank Keegan. Where'd he go? Um, our amazing ED at CSEF. There he is. Um, this past year has been amazing watching CSEF grow. Has anyone here ever had to read scholarship to applications? It's really hard. Um, we got over 250 amazing applications our first year, and I have a big heart. I just wanted to give money to everyone. They know how to pull on my heartstrings. Um, so please, if you enjoy tonight, you back our cause, please think about donating money to us. Also, a big thanks to New School. Um, Bruce, thank you. Lisa, you've been amazing with this. I'm super excited. Um, before I bring our panelists up, just want to read the room a little. Raise your hand if you're a skateboarder. Nice. Goofy footers? Regular footers? Yeah. All right. Uh, designers? Wow. Architects? My family? Yeah. <laughs> exciting. Exciting. Um, now, the way tonight is going to go, first we're going to bring up a panel of designers and skateboarders to talk about art, design, and skateboarding for about 30 minutes or so. Then we're going to do a quick Q&A, then we're going to shuffle them off, and we're going to uh, bring up our second panel to talk about skate parks, architecture, advocacy, and sustainability. So without further ado, let's get the show on the road. I would like to bring up Ali Asha, Ian Smile, and Beecham Jones. All right, wow, we're sitting down. Okay, so quickly, boys, um, who are you? How long, what's your design background? And what's your connection to skateboarding? Uh, hi, my name's uh, Aliasho Orkamore. Um, born in Western Mass, Amherst, Massachusetts. Grew up in Brooklyn, New York in the 70s and 80s and 90s. Um, definitely wouldn't even be in the career that I'm in if it wasn't for skateboarding. Um, <clears throat> I designed the, basically invented Fat Farm for Russell Simmons in 1992. Um, no biggie. Moved here to work for Ken Bach and Damon Way, uh, designing dub and drawers, and then some early DC apparel. Um, sorry. <laughs> it's uh, me trying to be more soft spoken than I already am. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, I, plus, I struggle with public speaking. Anyway, um, then um, started a company called Alphanumeric in 1996, or sorry, 19, 1998. Um, did that for a few years. Worked on stuff, helped Bob Hurley start his denim ca dem company or the denim branch of his brand. Um, worked with Nike on bringing the dunk into SB. Um, stuff, stuff, a lot, a lot of stuff. Um, I don't know. I'm not really good at talking about myself. Okay, that's good warm up. <laughs> okay. We'll go on to Ian here. My name is Ian Smile. Um, I'm a new California transplant. I moved here three years ago. Um, I am creative director for Skateboarding Hall of Fame and CSEF. Um, Mike Closer. Yeah, there you go. All the, all the quiet guys have to talk right. loud. Um, I'll get Brooklyn loud, too loud. Nice. Okay. Quiet. Um, I had a long career um, in corporate design in house uh, marketing mostly and got downsized three years ago. And we decided we were going to move to California. And I wanted to work in skateboarding. So that's kind of how I landed here. I met Thomas at the I Ask Summit. The, literally the first day that we were in California and it's kind of the rest is history and I, I've been skating since 
87, 88, and I love it so much in California. And every day is a better day than the last. So that's, that's kind of my short story. <laughs> my name is Beecham Jones. Uh, grew up in Louisiana, small town, uh, very rural. Grew up skating, found my first skateboard um, in my neighbor's yard of all places. The only concrete in the entire neighborhood was my driveway. Uh, how I got there, I don't know. Found a launch ramp like three days later in someone's trash. And <laughs> that was the beginning of it all. It, it took off. So um, I got bit by the bug and did it. Um, that was probably when I was 13. And um, did it uh, every day. That's all I thought. Ate, slept, everything was skateboarding. Uh, moved out to California in 99. Um, moved out here to pursue the next steps of skateboarding. Um, got injured pretty bad, kind of decided, well, and the kids were getting super good, so couldn't keep up with that. So uh, decided I was going to concentrate on a career. I'd gone to school for architecture and uh, decided that that's what I should put my concentration in. But the fun never stopped. I still skated for fun for so long. And you know, friends keep you there. It just, it's part of my life. They'll always be there. So, nice. so you're all skateboarders. You all grew up skateboarding. And then you became designers, basically. So we talked, or Bruce talked about the, in skateboarding, you have to try something a 1,000 times before you even get close, probably 10,000 times before you master it. That's just one trick. Um, I think the same kind of goes for uh, designing as well. Um, how has skateboarding influenced your design processes? And uh, let's kick it back to Beecham to start. Um, I would say determination and not giving in to failure is probably number one. Uh, you try over and over and over, as anyone who skate, skates knows. And, but that try and that next try is always going to be the next one. The next one is going to be the next one. The next one is, you know, and it's, it's like until you finally get it. And then the reward of when you get it is amazing. So, and it's such a small thing, but that small thing feels so big. So design's kind of the same way. It's, it's when you get it right and you feel the reward and when you're designing for a client and they're happy or and not just happy, like, oh yeah, that's good, and it's happy, but like you really solve the problem and you really solve something that is the next step that will benefit them, then it's that same feeling, you know, you kind of, you, you like that, that reward that happens inside. And so it's, that's, that's what I like about it. That's kind of what got me there. To, to play off of that a little bit, um, I'm a UX designer by trade now. Um, and iteration is a, a big thing because you, you will design something and design it again and test it and design it again. It's the same as hitting the stairs at El Toro. You know, you're going to, you're going to beat yourself up trying to get things done the right way. And, um, that's, I don't know. That's the main, that's the main thing is you're just, you're trying and trying again. You just need to be persistent. And I think that, especially now as a designer and the way the industry went, you gotta, you gotta bust your head open a little bit, honestly, to make it now. It's, you know, everyone's doing it the same way everyone in the world's skating. Everyone wants to be a pro. Everyone wants to be a designer now. You know, that's, that's the way the world went. So, you know, figuring out what style you can add to your work, I think is important. And that's how skating is too. What'd you do on El Toro? What did I do on El Toro? <laughs> uh, I, I switch flipped it nice. in my head. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I've driven past, walked up it, and yeah. then I walked down it. I got bad knees. I'm not even walking up or down El Toro. <laughs> For you non skateboarders in the room, uh, room, El Toro is a 20 stair handrail that's basically the Mavericks of skateboarding. It's on El Toro Road up in Orange County. You can go look at it. It's uh, amazing anyone's made it to the bottom. There you go. There you go. Uh, you want to weigh in on high skateboarding? <laughs> I, I think for me, the, the, the parallels and the allure, like, so when I first got into skateboarding, um, 
I sucked at sports. Um, I didn't want somebody yelling at me and telling me to drop and do 20 because I <laughs> couldn't fucking figure it out. Um, so skateboarding was this autonomous thing and I was only responsible and beholden to myself. So I had, in, if, in order for me to achieve whatever that, that goal was, that trick or that reward, it was just me. Um, and you couldn't show up and not, you know, you could be trying, but you really had to be trying. You couldn't just kind of show up with the guys I was around and just be pushing around. Um, can't fake the funk and skateboarding. No, you can't fake the funk and skateboarding. Uh, you can. I can tell how long you've been <laughs> skateboarding by how you pick up your board. Right. So. And, um, but the problem solving is, has, was always the, the most exciting part for me. How am I going to figure out how to do this? Um, and the trial and error. Uh, but the problem solving aspect um, and the sheer tenacity in which you have to approach everything because you're not going to make it unless you don't apply yourself. It's that simple. Um, it's not like running a drill, <laughs> you know, and you're not doing it for anybody but yourself. You can't teach it either. Yeah, yeah. No one's ever taught me. Anything. That's fair. Yeah. 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 Um, but the problem solving aspect and similarly in business and in design, particularly in design, you know, let's figure it out. And sometimes it's jump and sew the parachute on the way down. And sometimes it's a very calculated plan. I know that sounds contrary in some respects, but um, sometimes it really is a leap of faith with a little muscle memory. <laughs> <laughs> um, so for me, my whole life has been influenced by Tom Penny and Andrew Reynolds. They could have told me to do anything in the world and I would have done it. That's kind of the influence behind CSEF is uh, if Reynolds would have told me to go to college when I was 16, I probably would have done it. Um, so my question to you guys is who's the architect or who's the skateboarder that's influenced you the most, like professionally or you want to take it first or? Whoa. That's a, <laughs> wow. Um, you can say gone. But, right. That's a tough one. I mean, there's a, there's a, a, a pantheon of guys in my generation. So I started skating in 83. Um, so the people I looked at were the guys immediately around me. There was a guy named Bruno Musso, who was one of the founders of Shut Skates. And him and Rodney turned it into, it was a team. And then they turned it into a business. Um, and skating with, with Bruno was a big deal. Um, and his work ethic, uh, Jeremy Henderson, who's somebody that doesn't really get mentioned a lot, unfortunately. He's actually, I get a lot of Hall of Fame recognition. Yeah, for him. sure. I mean, kind of a different discussion, but uh, <laughs> more so than Andy Kessler. I feel like he's responsible for a lot of people's careers in New York yeah. um, and the paradigm shift of skateboarding in New York. Um, so Jeremy Hendrick, and also in that, he's one of the people that was like, you can't, I remember like trying to like ollie d upstairs and downstairs and not really trying. And he'd be like, look, if you don't try, it's not going to happen. It's not just going to willy nilly happen. You have to apply yourself. So even that is like early messaging for like um, work ethic. You got to put in the work. It's not going to happen if you don't work. Um, so him and then later, um, People like Dave Bergholt uh, from Blockhead. I ended up skating for Blockhead uh, in the late 90s, or sorry, late 80s, early 90s. And we have um, to clarify that you weren't a pro skateboarder. I was not a pro skateboarder. I was a B-grade amateur at best. <laughs> but that doesn't make me any less of a skateboarder. Um, um, John Lucero is another guy that I've always looked up to as a creative and as a business person. Um, Tommy and Jim, guys who have gone from skateboarders to business people. Nottis, um, as a skateboarder and as a business person and, and as a creative, um, watching his journey has been phenomenal. If you get the chance, I actually just watched it the other night, uh, a thing on, um, it's about 40 minutes about Nottis as a, as a creative. Well, his skateboarding, his creativity in skateboarding and how it went into uh, his art. His art and creative direction. 
Um, and for you non-skateboarders in the crowd, that's Nottis Coppice. And he's one of those people who's just Nottis now. Yeah. His, you basically, in, you're one of the inventors of street skateboarding. Yeah. Sorry. That's um, all right. And then he talks about David Carson, who worked at Transworld. Um, but not a lot of people, I don't think a lot of people know that. Um, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> it's a, the, the list spinning through my head right now. Um, just pick one. It's such a, it's such a tough call. Um, I mean, just cause I'm from Jersey, Mike Valley, first board I ever got. And it was 89, I think. Um, just cause he, he looked like he was having fun all the time and he was really mashing up a lot of different styles. Um, Rodney Mullen for his technical ability and just perseverance and just, you know, hearing the stories of him two in the morning, three in the morning, skating for, you know, six hours straight to try to get tricks down. Um, Blender, Gons. I just, I, I always liked the clowns and the artsy guys that just kind of had their own style. Um, and then, of course, Jim Thibault, you know, and honestly, everyone I've met out here has has contributed in some way. And it's, it's just some of the people in this room that I've met and become friends with. Um, the guys at Tony Hawk Foundation, Peter, Mickey, um, Steve Van Doren, you know, it, industry guys that we, we kind of separate them, but they're as much a part of the culture and creating as everyone ever, you know, everyone else that's picked up a skateboard. So, I mean, I, I applaud those. And Paul Schmidt, who's in the room, um, goes in the, goes in the schools and teaches kids how to build skateboards. You know, every, anyone that's involved in it is in all the way and it's a part of their life. So trying to pick, it's nearly impossible. It is an impossible list, I will agree. Um, and it goes through the times. It doesn't, the list never really stops. Uh, for me, I would say that just right off the top of my head would be Jason Lee, Matt Hensley, and Ray Barbie. Um, they were, they were like, not just the first I saw, but the first I saw that really just carried a style to another level. Uh, had their own style, completely unique to themselves. Um, they, they, they could have told me to do any, they could have told me to fly to the moon and I'd figure out a way to do it. So, uh, those, those three for sure. And then one that's really close to me, personal friend is Charlie Thomas, who's his determination for everything he does is just outstanding. So I learned a lot from that or from him, you know, on that side of things. So I, I could keep going. No, no, that's, that's a good list. <laughs> Um, you can Google some of those names when you get home. Um, so I kind of want to move on to a larger, the larger picture of skateboarding at the moment. We're in the Olympics. You got rap groups named who are skateboarders. Supreme's one of the biggest brands in the world, and it all stemmed from skateboarding. Um, I kind of interested in all three of you guys' perspective on like. What is, like, can you define that influence on modern design? Um, be it fashion, architecture, online, social media, like, what do you think is a big way that skateboarding has impacted the world at large? Um, you can switch it back to Beechin. Uh That's a good question. Um, as long, I started skating in 89, so when I started skating, I feel like... And you were in Louisiana at that I was point, in which is probably a little different than me. Small town Louisiana. Yeah, like growing up skateboarding around here where everyone skateboards. Yeah, you were... so I, where I grew up, it was me and one other guy, like <laughs> in, in our entire town. And then, you know, as we got older, we met other people. But, but uh, we had nobody to teach us anything. We just kind of like somehow figured it out. I don't know. It seemed a little inherent. We just made it work. I don't know. But... And then as we met people and, and got a little better. So my, my start was a little slow. But, but uh, as far as the influence, I've always noticed, um, even before I started skating, and kind of like once knowing the history before me, but the, the subculture has always kind of sparked the fashion for one, definitely. And I think the tie-in to that is music. Skateboarding and music have just always really, really blended together and 
and the two of those things kind of influence the fashion. And so the, the, I call it the triangle, but the three of those things just kind of all work together. And it doesn't matter what time period or phase of, you know, pop culture, it, it's always going to, those three things will be part of that influence. And so um, how it's grown into what it is today, I feel like is uh, just because of guys like him and him and you and a lot of the people out here who keep it going and just keep the, the, the edge pushed to the next level and the next thing and, and then the pop culture popularity that picks up on it and just takes it and it goes. So thank you for you for that. Yeah. <laughs> that's that's I don't know, that's my point of view. Um, I I think that everything's cyclical. And I think that there have been so many waves in skateboarding that parallel everything that we're we're lucky that we get to start we're starting everything you know um punk rock the warp tour you know everything has spun off of skateboarding there's a great um there's a great documentary called beautiful losers i don't know if anyone's seen it but um they talk about how it was barry mcgee it was the, the san francisco art scene the new york art scene in the alleged gallery and they talk about how a bunch of kind of misfit punk rockers weird kids art kids burnouts they all started this thing and they're all the creative directors now. And I think that says it right there is, you know, all these subcultures that are kind of looked down upon by society, they're kind of running the show. So you guys are next. I think that's amazing. Monopolize this thing, sorry. Um, To both your points with the, the subculture thing, I think skateboarding as a culture is similar to um, maybe that group of um, acid dropping mushroom taking cats that went to MIT and ended up, you know, st starting Apple. Um, <laughs> um, I feel like it, through my lens, skateboarding has always kind of been ahead of everything. I remember seeing like Steve Olson in ads uh, for like, not maybe Macy's or something when I was a kid. Um, and then later realizing like, whoa, that's Steve Olson. Um, or brands like Jimmy's that got big, started by a guy named Jim Ganser um, and a lot of the models that he used were skateboarders like Dave Hackett, Steve Olson, um, uh, Vince Klein, who's a surfer, um, and then Hasoy and Nottis and Scott Oster and Dressen were all in ads, and then Tommy Guerrero. Um, I the thing that that is remarkable, to, and then so then you have brands like Limpies that was started in San Diego. I think Skate Rags was started in San Diego. Um, for skateboarding uh, the original BBC not billionaires boys club but bad boy club uh, which was life's a beach also in San Diego um, who was creative directed by Doe's from Rocksteady crew which is a crazy one uh, it's gone on to be a fine artist um, but it's kind of always been ahead of the curve and it's it's this sad uh, almost abusive relationship where the garment industry tells it it's the ugly girlfriend. <laughs> but it's actually this beautiful thing that actually dictates what's been happening in the garment industry for years, for years and years and years. There's these dudes, I forgot the name, their names, these two cats from London, I met them in Japan. And they were the creative directors underneath Paul, Paul Smith, Lord Paul Smith, right? Uh, for a brand that he had started called Red Ear, which was a denim brand, super high-end Japanese denim brand. It was like this Brit Japanese thing that was happening. And there were these two South Bank kids. And they, we kind of indirectly knew each other through Carl Shipman, because wow. they had grown up with Shipman. Yeah. So it's not this new thing. Skateboarders have been embedded in fashion design for years and years and years, and kind of never get the credit that it's deserved, because it's threatening to the fashion industry. 
because it doesn't follow any of the rules. It creates its own rules, undeniably, right? It's like, we'll figure it out. That's kind of the, the jump out and so the parachute on the way down. It's just kind of part of what we do. Um, or problem solving, if you will, right? <clears throat> um, and so it's funny to me that now, like, and for years, like, the Dior guys have been copying, like, before 10 years ago, before the advent of social media, like, they were just copying shit directly. <laughs> but now it's, it's obvious. So you have stuff like, uh, what's that? Product, something product. Diet product. Diet product that's calling people out. Like, yeah. I wish that had existed years ago because I've been watching it for years. Yeah. Um, you know, and then all of a sudden, like, oh, skateboarding's hot. And then there was even this thing, uh, early 2000s, that, that the urban, let's say, like, Diddy and Jay-Z were like, oh, we got to capitalize on the skate thing. And that's what kind of when Pharrell dropped uh, BBC and ice cream. And they created this space called Skurban, which is horse shit. <laughs> it's just this, it's because... Everybody was afraid of, you know, I don't understand this box. What do you mean that there's guys, there's kids that skate in Air Jordans or kids that skate in, you know, $200 sneakers? Um, how could that exist? So the garment industry needed to create a box for it. And they called it Skurban, Skate Urban. Black kid skating, yeah. basically. Um, but it existed. If you went to SF or New York or any major city in the United States that existed, say, you know, Chicago, Detroit, it was everywhere. Um, and then the other end, the punk end, you know, you get Dior like copying old like Jimmy shirt, short, uh, shirts or old Limpy shirts or skate rag shirts, um, like directly. Um, way before the Thrasher boom, you know, now, so now Thrasher, you know, Thrasher sweatshirts are like part of people's like you know thrasher and closets. supreme That's right like... thrasher's a fashion brand right now yeah um not taking away from thrasher thrasher but right wrong or indifferently and for all intents and purposes it's become a fashion brand it's i would wager to say that the majority of its money is made from sweatshirt and t-shirt sales call me a dick but no no um, I, I... That but so, um, I don't know, it's just frustrating. <laughs> it's not a new thing to me and I've been watching it happen and it's just, it's, it's just like, hey, we've been way ahead of the curve for a long time. Yeah. Um, whether it's industrial design or fashion design or graphic design, people like Nottison and David Carson and the list goes on and on and on and on. Wow. Sorry. No. Anyway, was, uh... that's my two cents. <laughs> <laughs> The idea that you mentioned about um, skateboarders figuring it out, and yeah. and that's maybe what keeps us on an edge. Um, if we were embraced by the fashion industry at a much larger scale, do you think we would, we as a subculture, would be able to maintain that edge and keep it going? That's an interesting question. I mean, I look at what just happened with the the D three. The Dave Mayhew shoe, right? Um, and then ASAP Rocky, who's, you know, not a skateboarder. Not a skateboarder. <laughs> um, flagrantly copies the shoe and then gets called out. And then embraces And then embraces it because he has to, because he, he'll lose authenticity unless he does. Um, but that's not a new situation. How many times have we seen that? Um, that is one I would never have called the D3 coming back. I'm sorry. I, 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 I'm privy to a couple other situations that are, <laughs> that are uh, I'm watching unfold in front of me that are just like, are you guys serious right now? <laughs> um, I don't know, man. I, the, the, one of the beauties about skateboarding as an industry is that it takes care of itself. Um, How so? The fact that we're here yeah. is a prime example. Like the fact <laughs> that we're even having this conversation, um, or the fact that Paul's here, or Jim's here, or Mickey's here. Like um, skateboarders care about what skateboarders are doing, um, and we—it's 
it's a, an industry that's built by skateboarders. Um, you know, there's a, I remember watching documentaries and they're like, oh, this company is started by a bunch of guys that aren't skateboarders. And that's such a minute part right now. You kind of can't have a skateboard company run by non-skateboarders anymore. I don't think. Um, but sorry, I'm kind of gone off on a tangent. <laughs> but um, it's an industry that's built out of necessity. Yeah. Purely, like it is the the epitome of necessity is the mother of invention. Somebody like Paul is like, somebody has to make skateboards. I'm a skateboarder. I'm going to make skateboarders. I'm going to supply the demand. Um, I mean, even going back to drawers, I am heard drawers. the stories of yeah. like all of those guys wearing polo and all these fashion brands. Like, why don't we make that ourselves? And exactly. there's dub, like straight up yeah. urban outwear, outerwear for skateboarders. Yeah. And then part of my job was to bring it back to kids in New York that didn't skate. And they embraced it the same way they embraced Nautica and Polo and whatever else. Yeah. So, I don't know, I went off, sorry. Oh no, that was perfect. <laughs> <laughs> um, since the reason we're here tonight is because of a scholarship to New School for a Skateboarder, I just wanna talk about kind of the beginnings of design and your careers and just wanna know if you could go back to the beginning of your career and give yourself some advice what advice would you give you to the college kids out here about to hit the job market? And like Ian said, everyone wants to be a designer or a skateboarder. How do you differentiate yourself or what advice would you give yourself? Start with, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, it's all right. Um, this is a tough one. Um, I would just say soak up everything you can. Um, don't give up. Uh, start figure out where you want to be and and work work towards that path to get there um, you might take some wrong roads you might um, things are gonna happen along the way but if you keep true to an end an end goal um, that's and stay true to that along the way uh, you, you'll go where you want to go that's you just always have to go back to remember where you started and where you wanted to end up. And I think the road there is just the journey that you learn all your lessons along the way. I'm going to say the opposite. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, some contention. Um, life doesn't really, I don't want to say it doesn't have a plot, but there's, there's no ending, right? It's all about the journey. So trying to define exactly what you want to do, things don't always work out. I think diversifying and always learning is the best way to go now because everything changes so fast. Trying this, I started as a print designer, then I was a web designer. Now I'm an interaction designer, creative director. And I, you do all these different things. You live a lot of lives. And I feel like the more lives you live, the more rich, your work's gonna be. So I think mix it up as much as you can. And stay interested is another thing. Gotcha. Continue to learn and learn about everything. If you're a designer, don't only go on Twitter and talk about design. Don't only focus on one thing. The more you know, you can put all of that into everything you create. Yeah, I agree. Um, I think so I mentioned the like the so the parachute thing on the way out thing or on the way down thing, and I guess it, listening to um, both of these gentlemen it made me realize that it, that's actually you know so you talk about fly or die right but it's it's actually a, uh, more analogous to to um, self commitment. You've got to commit um, commit to the journey because it is all a journey, but you've got to commit to the journey. You don't know where it's going to take you, but you've got to be like, all right, I'm committed to this. I'm committed to like, and I'm going to get fucking knocked on my ass. I'm going to get the shit kicked out of me, but I'm going to figure it out. I'm sorry to be. Um, I had an entrepreneurship teacher say, you have to jump into the vacuum and let the vacuum take you. Yeah. And that's the biggest thing for businesses. You have to jump into it and start. Right. You know, you may start as a hardware company, but then you're a clothing company, you know, or you start as a skate shop and then you're supreme. You know, there's many. Yeah. As, um, a, as a designer, you iterate and you have to be iterating on yourself. For sure. 
Um, I would also say um, travel as much as you can. Um, travel is such a, a huge educational tool. I spent a lot of time in Hong Kong when a lot of my contemporaries didn't want to be there. They didn't want to visit factories. Um, they didn't want to visit the production houses that, that, uh, that worked with them. They didn't want to go to the YKK factory. They wanted the fancy box of zippers that came and they could, you know, oh, but if you go and you visit these places, you're getting ideas on how to make things because you're watching them being made and you're actually watching new processes happen on the floor. These guys are inventing new things while you're there. So, um, which is super inspiring, way more inspiring than social media will ever be. Um, go, like just go, even if it's a different town, if it's a different part of the US, if it's other parts of North, just go, like go, yeah, go, <laughs> that too, get off the phone and go outside. Um, but really like, uh, you know, when in Rome, unless it's detrimental, um, that's what I'd say. That's great. Um, well, that was perfect. So we're going to open up it, some audience participation here. There's a mic in the back. If anyone has a question from any of these gentlemen, if you're in the front rows, please walk around. Don't be shy. Um, oh, can you go over to the microphone? Yeah, sorry. For our audience at home watching on the webcast. Um, one thing I've thought about a lot recently is there's like a huge sense of camaraderie in skateboarding, just growing up, having your friends, whether they cheers you on or pushes you harder to do something. Um, there's also not very many aspects in my life where I could enjoy it, like skating with a seven year old, you know, it's, it's, I can't do, there's not too many other things I can do that or have that with. Um, how has that helped you in design or in this, in the industry or the lack of Skateboarding keeps you Hello? young. Hello? Hello. Hello. Uh, um, how has camaraderie in skateboarding <laughs> 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 or the lack thereof influenced your career? I mean, my dad came to Poods Park one time. And he said, this is the only place in the world where you're going to see a nine-year-old girl recreating, recreating with a 55-year-old man. Like, that doesn't exist. And I think, like, skateboarding definitely keeps you young. Like, there's the Lance Mountain quote. Like, you didn't grow old, or you didn't get old. You're not too old to skate. You're old because you quit skating is basically the gist of it. And I think that's kind of what you're asking. So, um. have, have you ever gone to networking design events? <laughs> <laughs> They're usually pretty bad. Yeah. Um, I, I've had experiences where I just – dress a certain way. I'm an old school punk rocker, so I'll be wearing, you know, a Sham 69 t-shirt. Or one time I was at Adobe Max, I was wearing an H Street hoodie. And people were coming up to me and saying, hey, you skateboard, I skateboard. And that's happened all over. And I think that's like, that's kind of a stock thing that if you're dressed that way, I see him on the street, I see him on the street. I know that kid skates. We have that in common. And that's like, that's better than business cards. Honestly, you know, you know, you know, anywhere you go in the world, you can go talk about punk music. You can go talk about the skate video you watched. And that's how it's, it's just it's it's more natural because you have something in common versus, hi, I'm Ian. I'm a designer. What do you do? Oh, you're a designer, too, because we're at the networking thing together with all the other designers <laughs> like, all right. So it's just it's it's natural. And we're all we're all family. That's what it comes down to, and family helps family out. Um, I don't, I, what was the question again? <laughs> <laughs> I'm just kidding. No, I'm kidding. Um, camaraderie. Uh, Hannah, I heard that. <laughs> uh, for, I think with skateboarding, it's friends. You have friends that no matter what, and as I've grown older, I've kind of learned 
along the way, your friends have been much different than you in many ways, except skateboarding. Skateboarding is like the one thing that it's like the glue that held you all together. And that camaraderie, I think, is what you're talking about. And when you get older um, and in, in the design professional world, um, the design that your, your camaraderie is your, your office or your colleagues or, or whatever, your teams, yeah. And, and that camaraderie feels the same, although it's not quite as, you have the camaraderie because you're all working on the same stuff but it's not the same passionate. Although I'm not saying that design and profession is not passionate, it's just not the same. And it's really hard to explain, um, but I think everyone in this room can probably relate or knows what I'm talking about in some way. Whereas if another skateboarder walked into your office and was a designer, it's like instantly you're like, that guy is awesome. You know, we're gonna be hanging out all the time talking about everything from skateboarding to design. Everything's gonna flow easier. Every, you just kinda, there's a lot of things you just get. And, and um, I think it's because of skateboarding. Yeah, definitely because of skateboarding. I don't know if that made sense. No, that's perfect. All right. <laughs> yeah, to parallel, parallel that a little bit, because we're supposed to be talking about work too. Yeah. Um, with teams, you have your group of friends that you skate with. You have the one kid that kick flips really good. You have one kid that skates transition really good. You know, you help each other out and that's the same in the work environment where you have your dev, you have your visual designer, you have your product manager, your project manager, and everyone puts their best effort forward to make the best skate team or the best design team. So. Not really sure what to add. Um, you don't have to. We could go to a second question. We'll see. Second question. Yes, right. <laughs> yeah. Sorry about that. No, no, no. It's it's a great question. Um, uh, so an interesting one from my own career. So I left. I worked on let's say Seventh Avenue, which the the fashion fashion, fashion industry, right? Um, and similarly, you, you'd run into people that you knew from skating or somebody that skated and you kind of just spot each other, you know, you know, somebody's got vans on. Before everybody in the world wore vans, it was kind of like a bad Every honor, one. Right? Um, but there was a point in New York where somebody had vans on, they are either from California, a punker, a skater, or a BMXer, that's it. It wasn't this, thing that it is now and nine times and then you just look for the ollie hole right um and then there's this automatic connectivity but i remember you know in this four-year window uh, um trying to introduce things that were i guess thought processes that i'd learned from uh, working in the skate industry and um, getting a lot of pushback. Um, I don't know, kind of going off on a tangent. <laughs> but anyway, um, yeah, let's skip that one. <laughs> Sorry. Do we have any other questions out there? Uh, or I'm going to skip that one. Sorry. Well, I'll throw you one more question if no one's here. Oh, oh, get it, get it. I, uh, <clears throat> I just wanted to uh, get your opinions on sort of like the paradigm shift of like what you were talking about with uh, sort of different sponsors that come into skateboarding and kind of a different crowd altogether or a more inclusive crowd. Um, do you see any kind of downsides to that? I mean, as opposed to, you know, it's like we gain a lot of corporate sponsors that put money into skateboarding and then we lose, you know, something like a, like a Trans World magazine. Is there kind of a shift of, uh, you know, pros and cons between something like that happening in such a big industry? 
It's, com it's complicated. Yeah. I mean, yeah, I think you have to depend on the product category, definitely, because in footwear, it's what hurt the most. In the early 2000s, we had skate footwear brands. There was five to ten of them. They were a couple hundred million dollars each. They were booming. And then you look like Adidas, Nike, New Balance, they come in suddenly like it took those resources or that sales away from those companies. Um, but on the flip side, like those companies brought in professionalism. They brought in, you know, supporting riders in ways that um, those smaller brands couldn't. So it's definitely like a catch-22, I think. With the Olympics coming, this is going to be a top of the conversation. But it's always been there. And it's like I like to say, like, it's a gateway drug. Like, if you – like, because I deal with also, like, we do – I work with uh, Rolling from the Heart, so we do after-school programming. And it's like some of the kids are on scooters, some of the kids are on penny boards, whatever. But it's like all you need to do is push once to fall in love with it. Then years later, you'll find the Gonzes, you'll find the Stevie Williams, you'll find like, you'll you'll grow into it. When we were all kids, we didn't know any of that. So it's like, if those gateways are created because of that, more the merrier. Like, I think the more people that skate, the better the world's gonna be. So, you know, so it's like, and uh, from the brand's point of view too, like, you know, like more, like people are like, oh, people who don't skate are buying stuff. Like, well, those people are supporting these people's families. Like behind every brand, there's people who work there, who have families, who have kids, who have, you know, sending kids to college, you know? So it's like the bigger skateboarding is, the more they lift it up, the more we're gonna support those people. So, you know, but it, so it's definitely like a figure out, figure it out as we go. You know, obviously some companies walk in, totally kook it. Like skateboarders are good at pushing them out right away, you know? So, um, I mean, that's just kind of my quick two cents from working um, with the industry association the last few years, but you definitely hear it from brands that obviously like they're a little jealous of Nike's marketing budget, so. <laughs> <laughs> to that same point, it, Nike was trying to penetrate skateboarding for 10 years and then they finally realized they had to hire a bunch of skateboarders and guys that came from the skateboard industry. That to, was to all your right. fault. Right? No, it wasn't. Or, okay. <laughs> I just told them what shoe to use. Okay. okay. <laughs> the rest is, yeah, yeah. as blame Kevin Imamura for yeah. that one. Okay. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, they, and to that same point, look how long it took a behemoth of a company like that to penetrate skateboarding. That's how protective we are of what we have. Right, because they've been trying for years. Until they figured out the right shoe. It was a shoe that they had, forgot what it's called. I don't remember it later, but they had, Gons was getting Nikes for a long time, like way, way back. I mean, I still um, remember their first ads that were actually like rad, where it was the, what if we treated all athletes like skateboarders? And it was a photo of a baseball diamond that was like knob. And then there was like a basketball court with like cops arresting the guys or something. Right. It was kind of like, that was one of their first forays into it. I'm talking the 80s. Oh. <laughs> but yeah, that was a brilliant ad campaign for yeah. sure. It's probably one of the best. I actually wish they would re release that. It yeah. Was a great, great campaign. But anyway. Mm -hmm. Does that answer your question at least? Yeah. 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 Do we have any other questions out there or we should get a. Bueller. Oh, wait, Anyone? Keegan? Keegan? We have a question from the live stream actually. And you were just talking about, excuse me, you are just talking about um, why are other sports not treated illegally, the skateboarding is an illegal thing, etc. Uh, They're jealous. Right. <laughs> what about legalized outdoor architectural spaces, the future of street skating, interactive art, legal skating, public spaces, use of public space, which kind of leads into the next panel. Yeah, I think we'll save that one for the next panel. Yeah. But uh, I have it in my pocket, actually. Thanks, Ethan. Yeah, nice. Well, thank you, gentlemen. This was really great. It wasn't uh, public speaking can be rough. But... I'm sorry for all the profanity. Oh. Yeah. Yeah, nice. Nice. Well, thank you, guys. Um, now I'm going to bring up our next panel that I'm really excited about. Um, so welcome to the stage, Peter Whitley, Canton Russell. And they wanted to go right into it, but yeah, yeah. Peter Whitley and Canton Russell. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh. 
So you guys have to share mics. Figure that out. Hello. No, oh, they all work. You just have to share. Hi, guys. Hi, Thomas. Hi. Right. I'm really excited about this panel because I worked with Pete at the Tony Hawk Foundation. He was my basically, uh, I consider him my graduate school tutor right here. And then Kent Russell and I worked together on the Encinitas skate park. I was the advocate and he was the designer. And uh, I think Steven's gonna bring a great perspective to this um, from his lens. So can you guys just start out with uh, giving a little bit of uh, who you are, how long you've been working in skateboarding or what's your connection to skateboarding, what do you do? Uh, I'm Peter switch. Whitley, I'm the programs director with the Tony Hawk Foundation. I see some of my colleagues in the back. Hey. Uh, we help communities build skate parks. We help them advocate for and organize their efforts, uh, lay out the plan for getting the skate parks done and uh, informing design and uh, construction selection, site location, the whole bit to ensure that the skate park is a success. We're bumping ships there, Canton. Whoa. Um, <laughs> hey. <laughs> there is advocate and builder, right? Bumping chairs. Typical. And, uh, <laughs> Bumper cars. So um, before running into skateboarding, I was uh, a senior art director. Well, I was an art director as a career and as a senior art director for a division of Hasbro called Wizards of the Coast, where we did um, Dungeons and Dragons and uh, Avalon Hill board games, Magic the Gathering, Pokemon cards. So I've been involved with interactive design in some fashion for a number of years and it's when I was working in the games industry that I started seeing the beautiful overlaps between skate parks and game spaces and seeing people come together in sort of a central conceit with a common um, sense of identity and purpose and competition but in a playful and constructive and additive way that I really loved so much that I was like fuck the game industry I'm gonna go to skateboarding and so I joined the Tony Hawk Foundation with, um, uh, and it's been lovely. And I just absolutely love skateboarding and I love skate parks and I love everybody. So, <laughs> good night. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, Canton Russell, I actually grew up here in San Diego. Um, yeah, skateboarding a lot of the, yeah, I grew up in the Ocean Beach area. Went to Ocean Beach Elementary, Correa, Point Loma High School, which all became very famous skate spots. Um, and I actually started off as an advocate as well. So growing up in Ocean Beach, we had no skate parks that were open. The Del Mar Skate Ranch had closed the year I turned legal age to ride there, I guess 15. Um, and so for about nine years, we advocated, did a lot of fundraisers, events, parades, all kinds of things to raise awareness to try to get a skate park through the city of San Diego, which was the first of that kind for the city. And um, so a lot of people always talk about, oh, it takes so long to get a skate park. It's, you know, I've been on that side of the fence. And uh, it wasn't until later, um, you know, when I was actually just getting out of high school, I actually became a pro skateboarder at a 19 so i was pro for about um 12 years wow. and so i was actually a pro skateboarder when we actually finally got the ocean beach skate park you know approved open built and ironically the person who worked on that skate park uh, on the design end uh, mike mcintyre actually was approached by him 10 years later to work with him to design skate parks um neither one of those uh, career paths was intentional for me um, skateboarding was just something I liked to do. I was passionate about it and an opportunity happened where I could do that as a career and get paid and make a living and have a family and buy a home and things like that, which is awesome. And then as I was really far into skateboarding, having done it for quite a while going into my early 30s, I was thinking, what am I going to do next? Can I do something that's a little bit different, creative? I actually started getting interested in just other kind of design. I end up interning at the city of Chula Vista, going back to school. I was learning about engineering, surveying, CAD design, a lot of things that had nothing to do with skateboarding or skate parks. So when people are talking about the journey and having a lot of different opportunities and options that, that are possibilities, uh, that those skills I learned in that environment and actually ended up working in an engineering firm actually helped me get a job 
where I was approached by Mike to work with him on skate park design many years later. So it's weird how things, uh, because you're preparing yourself or learning skills and opportunities happen and you can, you know, kind of lead your, have your path lead you that way, just like in skateboarding, it's really all about adapting. So with career opportunities, adapting to things that are, are, were options for me, led from one career involving skateboarding into a whole another career involving skateboarding. And neither one of those were super intentional but it's just because I followed kind of what I was passionate about. It just happened that way. So I've been designing skate parks now for 13 years. Um, very fortunate to do both. And uh, yeah, we're very busy. A lot of skate parks out there, a lot of designing happening. <laughs> I'm Steve Shin. And if we have had pros up here and B grade amateurs, I must be down in that F minus <laughs> amateur level. Um, the, I, I spent a lot of my childhood in Africa, and uh, at least when I was growing up there, they didn't have skateboards. But I, I did get introduced to skateboards when I was in the eighth grade, and I, I moved to the US. And uh, with my younger brother, our goal when we got our first skateboard was one person rode the bike, the other person tied the jump rope to the back of the bike, <laughs> and rode the skateboard and held on for dear life. And the goal was to lose the person on the skateboard. <laughs> I don't recommend that it's an Olympic sport. Actually, I don't recommend that in general at all. Uh, but after uh, that, uh, uh, going on to school in architecture, uh, I, uh, after uh, graduating, I did get involved in inline skating. And then about five years ago, when I moved here to San Diego, I got my second skateboard. And the, 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 the reason of the rationale behind that was actually going back to uh, a lot of my focus in the field of architecture and design. I uh, have a, a strong interest and uh, focus in urban design, promoting uh, urban living, downtown living. I have a strong interest and focus in sustainability and health and wellness. And what I found out once I relocated here to San Diego, I uh, intentionally found a, a firm and I work with Gensler here downtown. I wanted a firm that was in our downtown. I live downtown uh, about 12 blocks away and I'm, or, I'm involved with several different organizations that are all downtown between the new school, uh, the American Institute of Architects and the San Diego Green Building Chapter. And I realized that getting a skateboard to get around to all those different organizations fit into all of those objectives. Uh, it, I, I have my bamboo skateboard. It's uh, very sustainable. Uh, it is promoting that downtown and urban living. Uh, it's promoting an active lifestyle. And so my interests in design have really led me to skateboarding as opposed to maybe the other way around. Perfect. Um, so I kind of want to start with the basics here since there are probably people in this room that have never been to a skate park. And I think people have different, different definitions of what a skate park is. Pete, do you have like a, a easy, um, handy definition of what you consider a skate park? Uh, I do not <laughs> have an easy one. Why don't I, I'd oh. like to borrow a microphone. <laughs> um, I, ha I have some complicated definitions of skate parks, but Fundamentally, I don't really believe that skate parks require a definition as long as yeah. we have purpose place, purpose built places to skate. I, I guess I should have prefaced this as so cities all across the US call you and they say all these kids want a skate park. What does that mean? Kind of what how do you take them through exactly what that means to the kids in there? Well, thing? we there's a lot of things to cover. We want to establish where they are in the process. But basically what we're asking them to do is start a local movement. Of, of their peers and find supporters for this idea that skateboarding should have a place in their community. It, it's kind of a need that doesn't really exist in the broad sense in the community, in the community's understanding until the advocates get busy. So it, it's, a, it's a complicated task that they both have to create this situation for the public to understand and then come in with a solution of the skate park. What the public does understand is kids rattling downtown making a racket and alling off of things and scraping off the furnishings and being um, disobedient 
yeah. and so that's generally the catalyst for a lot of a lot of skate spaces but what we want to really push for is we want to push for a sense of um uh the benefits that are coming from skateboarding and have facilities that amplify those so that we can all enjoy healthier communities as a result not as a means of corralling kids or keeping them from being shitty kids nice. right so a city <laughs> we're not trying to prevent shittiness <laughs> we're trying to create goodness that's what we're trying to do <laughs> So a city calls you, you kind of give them the basics and then probably Canton's their next call sometimes. Well, we're looking at about a three, on average, about a three year process of community activism and volunteerism. Okay. So that's including the preparation, getting out into the meetings, doing the fundraising, getting buy-in from the city and all the stakeholders, meeting out, meeting with the community. And a lot of times there's not a formal process in place for this. So they have to invent the process as they go along and that requires mistakes. So they're out fumbling, trying and trying and trying and trying with a vision for what they want the outcome to be until it starts moving forward. And it's the exact same pattern that we see when we watch a kid learn how to ollie for the first time. So there's a lot of sort of scaling of the learning processes. Skaters put themselves into learning opportunities and they challenge themselves and then they overcome and they meet those challenges and then they apply that same template to all kinds of other shit. Yeah. That's basically how it works. That's the simplest version. So the skate park is the place where kids go and learn how to do that. Hey, Jim. <laughs> so, um, so that's kind of what skate parks are about as far as I'm concerned. Can't Sorry be if, my, oh, no. if my modulation is... Oh. I, I didn't know wobbly. you had a mic. Oh. It was I even mic? Yeah, yeah, you, we can hear you. Um, can't um, like when a city calls you, like where's the building block? Where, where do you start? Um, a lot of the same places Peter was talking about, a lot of people just want help of know where do we start. And sometimes we will actually refer them to the Tony Hawk Foundation. Um, and a lot of times we just try to tell them what we've seen that works. I mean, and like I said before, I was an advocate. I went through the process. I went to the public input meetings and shared, you know, what we thought we wanted in that space where we lived. Now, what we wanted in San Diego may be totally different than what someone wants in Boston or in Canada or in Copenhagen or wherever the project is. So we, don't, we can't pretend to know what they're going to want. We just have to be good listeners. And, you know, we're always learning about how to help create something that can be good for them to explore. You know, skateboarding is about adapting. So there's no, like, perfect signature park Everyone has oh, certain styles. Yeah, everyone has certain styles they like and, and terrain that they like, but it's really up to us to try to give them something that they can kind of like be creative in. If, if it's just too, too sterile, too perfect, you're not really opening enough, enough creativity for adapting. And we like to see how people are using this space totally different than we imagine it to be used. Um, so a skate park is really just a legal place that is set up through a city or a county that you can ride in. Um, sometimes you can make it look like it's not supposed to be a skate park. And that's where the whole philosophy of poods came from. And in Sanitas, the direction we got from you guys, the community was, we want something that doesn't look like it's supposed to be a skate park. We want something that's very natural, accessible, um, some place we can hang out at all day and not feel like we're checking in and checking out like some of the older parks that had big prison fences with barbed wire. And you almost felt like you weren't even welcome into your own space. So, you know, the oxymoron of a lot of skate parks in the past is we're going to build a skate park, but we're, we're going to make it very difficult for you to ride in here. We're going to make you pay. We're going to set hours. We're going to tell you what you can and can't do. Or and we it was, put it right next to the police station. It, because it was, you guys are all such deviants. Yeah. So that's so it, what we think of you. So it can be a big turnoff. So, so the more natural and inviting and, you know, community orientated it is, the, the more successful it can be. And so a lot of times we don't try to have this signature style or, or, you know, it's more about the result. You know, if you can go by there and see people using it every day, that's success. It's not about the coolest looking terrain or the cool colors or whatever it is. It's, are those people who live there going to use a space and they come there and they're like, yeah, we came up with this. It's our park. They're taking ownership of it. That to me is more of a, a successful skate park, but it's really just a place they can ride and be creative and be happy. Nice. Um, Steven, I think it's so interesting that you're up here because I, I was a skate park advocate and I worked for many years to get Poots Park built. And it seems like a lot of the same steps uh, for public advocacy for a skate park 
are probably the same steps as getting public transportation, walkability. Um, do, or is, does it seem like from what, how Pete kind of described the process that it's kind of the same um, going from idea to group to meeting with the city to then having a 10 year plan to get something built? Is it kind of the same way? Or is it different when you're talking about large urban areas like this? Um, I think the process is actually probably very similar. And uh, I can probably say I've never been in a skate park because I'd probably kill myself if I tried. <laughs> uh, but I would be, a, I'm a big advocate for skate parks from the standpoint that those are places where you can create community. You can give people an opportunity to learn how to, to skate. They can do the kinds of tricks and uh, aerial maneuvers that they should be doing in that kind of a forum that has been designed for it as opposed to other areas. Uh, what I've been uh, focused a bit more on, and, and one of the reasons that I do, I, I still continue to uh, skate every day to work in my jacket and messenger bag and dress shoes. By the way, the fashion industry is really missing out. You know, <laughs> you, 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 you need to come up with some, some, some new attire. You know how many kids' Instagrams you've probably been on? Uh, like? but believe it or not, uh, <laughs> I, th that has happened. I have, <laughs> I have had tourists stop and want to take my photograph. <laughs> they don't know that I've only been a Californian for five years. <laughs> I have had teenagers on skateboards following me down with their iPhones, <laughs> photographing me. So I'm on YouTube somewhere, I'm sure. Uh, but actually, I think that that's really great because it's going to help promote skateboarding as an alternative means of getting around town and making it more accessible to the general public and getting it brought back into our urban neighborhoods where it has in many cases been banned. And I think that we as a community need to work on that. Uh, if we can uh, rethink and uh, think about how transit and how we move around a city and as opposed to going from a monomodal form of transit being cars to a multimodal form of transit where you can introduce skateboards and we're seeing more bikes and we're seeing more scooters um, and there's you know, sidewalks for walking and jogging and we have bike paths. Uh, we need to find a way to really get the skateboards re-ingrained into our cities as a mode of transit. And I think that that would actually benefit the skate board community and it would benefit the cities as a whole. Here, here. Um, so I kind of want to jump around my questions here because like, so Canton, one of the things that I thought was really interesting from working with you on the Foods Park was you brought, you were talking about sustainability and different things you were going to do from the get-go. We didn't understand that. All we cared about was the hit or the, the right ledges or whatnot, but like from a city's point of view, having it be sustainable, have it being, you know, zero wasted water and stuff like that. Um, can you just talk about like what you do to make a skate park sustainable? Um, yeah, a lot of what goes into a skate park are the things you can't see. And so there's a lot of infrastructure that goes into that. And what he was saying, you know, a lot of planning, you know, the first thing is finding uh, where it should go. And because of this whole complete street movement and really getting people walking, riding, biking, creating potential skate paths in the future, um, there's, there's this thing about putting it in the site that where it should be. And it's a lot of times you get places where maybe it should not be. Um, the Encinitas site wasn't really that great. It was actually contaminated. Yeah. So there was a lot of work we had to do to remediate the soils there. And even during construction, they had to do a lot of measures to protect their environment by covering it up every day yeah. afterwards so that all the contaminants that had been buried in the soils from the um you know from the greenhouses there for years and all the pesticides in the ground it wasn't just spewing into the neighbors mm -hmm. so it's really thinking about what happens in the ground the soils um how you can do recycled materials if possible and then also how the biggest thing is stormwater how to capture the water hold the water treat the water let the water infiltrate into the ground naturally instead of um, dumping it into storm sewers and you know, polluting other sources of water. And so that, um, and also sustainability can be also thought about as how can we create this to be a long lasting supportive environment so that you're not building something and then tearing it down and moving it. 
Um, the big discussion that's happened in Seattle, we're working on a project uh, with the, less, the rest of the team up there that uh, is the fact that they've had to move, you know, build, tear down, build, tear down. They're on their, they're on their fifth skate park in downtown Seattle. So the whole thing is how can we create something that is so uh, inviting, inclusive, that it's not going to be tore down again. So in a sense is creating something sustainable that can last longer there, that can also resist weather and a lot of other conditions that might erode and wear something out where you'd have to replace it. Sustainability can also be thought of in that. What kind of materials are you using that's gonna, that's gonna hold up long-term? So the idea of, oh, let's just use raw ledges because that's what's in the street, that sounds great, but then six months from now, that's probably not gonna be a grindable ledge anymore. I know that was a problem at Kettering. When they did the Kettering Park, it just got obliterated really quick. And then all of a sudden, no one could really skate and do their favorite tricks on their ledge. It just wasn't really functional. So if we can make something that is aesthetic, but has some cool architectural pieces to it, but also um, is durable, that also in itself is, is some sustainability to add to that. Interesting. <laughs> um, I don't really quite remember what the complete question was, but, but one thing that I do love about skate parks in terms of sustainability and, and their flexibility in dealing with site issues or environmental issues is that they don't have to be square. So if you want the concrete to be, if you want a strip of impervious surface, you have one to work with. If you want a big circle or a square or a long channel, you can also activate existing infrastructure by putting skate spots next to paths, say bike paths, if the bikers, bicyclists, I guess, they don't like to be called bikers, I guess. <laughs> um, but if the bicyclists will allow it, they don't, yeah, right? they don't tend to like skateboarders on their bike paths because of the different speeds and the different ways that skaters move and stuff. But, but uh, I mean, one thing I will say is that, um, you know, sometimes the, what you put around the park um, or the site can be a very awkward looking shape, like you said. And, and a lot, what we find is that the shape and the conditions of the projects will help create the look of it, the shape of it, the size of it. You know, how big can you go based off the conditions? Or, you know, you can actually, like he said, you can put landscaping or permeable, non-skatable materials on the inside of the park. And that way you're kind of making it bigger, more spread out. And then also you're dealing with the drainage on the inside and the outside of the park. So um, a lot of times, you know, if you're just looking at a aerial view or plan view of what a, a modern skate park or a skate plaza can look like today, people are going, where is, where is a skate park? Because it just doesn't look like it's a skate park. And sometimes that's good. And that goes back to what he was talking about is incorporating and kind of blending the lines of urban terrain and intentional space that's used for skateboarding. And sometimes that's good. But it's, it's a reuse, recycle, right? So if you have a ledge that everybody loves in town, there's really no reason to go and build that ledge again if you can see to liberating that spot with the city. So there's plenty of places where skaters can actually go back to the spots that were knobbed and illegalized, illegalized, and, uh, and they're getting tickets at, and they can make a case to go back and repair that ledge and make it butter and, and then make it legal. And, and it's working, like cities are doing this all over the place. So for anybody who's had to appear in skateboarding for a skateboarding ticket, I don't know how many of those there are out there, but I certainly have some. Uh, that's, this is a solution for that, and it's super sustainable because you're not doing anything. You're, you're just undoing. Steven, you mentioned to me like you had a few things that you learned from skateboarding that helped you with your designs. Um, I, I've, well, it, it, from, from that standpoint, I've learned that uh, less is more. Uh, architects and even landscape architects tend to uh, like to uh, clutter, decorate, um, add lots of materials and textures to our walking surfaces, our sidewalks, our plazas, our public places, our public spaces. And, uh, you know, being, uh, I, 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 by the way, I, I, I cycle, I inline skate, and I, I skateboard. And I think that all three of those can easily coexist together. And the more of a mixed environment you can create for that, the better off you are. <clears throat> but I have quickly learned that inline skating and skateboards uh, do not like uh, 
all of those different materials. And so I've, I've, I've realized that they, they, at times from a design strategy, you know, coming up with simple solutions and more continuity in terms of how you think about your design can oftentimes be more successful in creating a, a great environment, whether that's all the way down to the materiality and the detailing of it, or in, just in, even in terms of the large scale building that you're building. I mean, he hit a home run right there. It's, that's <laughs> our total philosophy. I mean, having worked for a lot of different firms, um, everyone has their different philosophy what the terrain should be, but the whole less is more thinking really works well. And you know, if we're gonna go back and talk about Poots Park, um, there are a lot of people who are looking at this space there and say, whereas, you know, we need more in here. It's like, no, you need less. Because if you have more than 20, 30, 40, 50 people there, as you well know, and there's a lot of people who go to these projects, especially in Southern California or anywhere where there's good weather year round skateboarding, you're going to have a lot of people using the space. So where are they going to enter? Where are they going to stand? Where are they going to stand to wait their turn? Um, you know, is there enough room around the bowl for everyone to, to coexist? The other thing is the act of skateboarding itself, if you ever watch videos, the distance from someone to set up for a trick, compress, pop, grind, land, compress, decompress, that could easily be 60, 80 feet, 100 feet. So you need that kind of room to really be able to do some of the tricks that people are talking about on a real street spot or a real plaza area downtown, like Pulaski in DC. It's just a huge open flat area with some ledges. And I think the less is more philosophy is people would rather have quality, a really good quality ledge, a really good quality flat bar, a really good quality bowl or transition, than a bunch of things that are just littered and kind of haphazardly placed that don't really have flow, they don't really link together, and they don't skate well. But it looks great on paper because there's a lot of stuff in there, but it doesn't mean it's good. You're kind of, that, you kind of jumped to my next question. It's like, I think most skateboarders point of view or um, on how a skate park is built or designed is from Tony Hawk Pro Skater, where you're moving around blocks and everything. I'm guessing there's more to it than that, and it's a little bit more complicated. What's like the biggest misconception that you get from skateboarders? I think you kind of hit it, but. <laughs> um, you know, it, it does, it all looks easy. You know, all, you know it's, it's been done. You know, you look at one park, you've seen, you know, two, three, four. I mean, I think I'm on maybe 250 that I've done. Um, they're all different for various reasons. And even though you may see a bowl and it looks the same, it's not the same because maybe what's in it, the radius, the transition, the blends, like he was talking about, the detailing and the materials that goes into even a simple grind ledge, they're all a little bit different based off what you do with them. And everything down to the inch or even less than an inch can really make or feel different because skateboards and I, I you know, even going back to the bikes and, and scooters and everything else, I mean, skateboard wheels themselves are very tiny. They're, they go by millimeters for a reason. So they feel everything. So you really have to make sure that it goes into the quality of design, quality of construction, so that you, know, you don't want to put uh, the normal kind of expansion joint you see in a sidewalk right in front of a staircase or right at the bottom of a staircase. So you know, what you see as a finished product is there's a lot of things that have to go into thinking about how to make that very functional but aesthetic. And yeah, there's a lot of uh, trial and error that goes into it. We've learned from a lot of mistakes over the years. Parks that are done now are way different than they were 20 years ago for a reason. And it's just, how can we be students? How can we learn to make them better all the time? We're always learning different techniques and means and methods to, to make them better for sure. One of, the, one of the things that I've always liked about skateboarding was that the tolerances on your wheels were so small that that it kind of was the most or the least forgiving of all of the sort of action sports. It's not attached to your feet. It's <laughs> the wheels are small. Any little rock can ruin your month. <laughs> and <laughs> I mean, I mean the, the tolerances we use for agencies who say, well, it's good enough. No, you it's know? not. So, so the thing is, if a tennis court has such strict tolerances where it has to be post-tension slab, perfectly smooth all the way from one end to the other. Skate parks have to have the same tolerance and they're not even riding around on wheels. It's just running and, you know, it, it's, it's still critical because I've, I've tried to play tennis and it's really hard on the joints. You're doing a lot of movements and God forbid you do hit a crack, you'd probably be in trouble. 
<laughs> but it's the same thing in skateboarding. You can't, you know, jump and ride and do the things you're doing and catch a, catch a, a seam or, or something and say, well, it was close enough. And then all of a sudden you're thinking about the safety and welfare and health for the people who are using it. We have to, we have to be responsible on that end. The, the low tolerances, I think, are an interesting reflection of, um, say, skateboarders' tolerances, tolerances in the cultural sense that skateboarding is super protective of its boundaries and its bullshit detector is like on super alert. And, and in fashion, it's pretty, it's pretty clear when somebody comes in and starts eating somebody else's lunch. In skate parks, we have the evidence of that nonsense still because some really terrible, terrible individuals in the world have gone and built terrible skate parks and then now those kids are suffering and it's well, making me cry. And but on the flip <laughs> side, I grew up at two horrible skate parks, Lucadia Skate Park, which is a spot, and then Car Old Carlsbad Skate Park, or the second Carlsbad Skate Park. And uh, it kind of goes into that social aspect of the skate park. I loved it because my friends were there. That's where I met all my friends. Like, and then so it's like one of those things where it's almost like a little brother, like you can, I can call, I can say my skate park sucks, but you are not allowed to say it. You know, it kind of goes into that. Um, I mean, yeah, if you grew up there, I mean, we talked about this. They were talking about tearing that down. You're like, but that's where I grew up. That's, that's kind of like has a nostalgic you yeah. know, thing to me. Yeah. And again, you know, a lot of the skate parks and Jim, you could probably, you know, attest to this, but a lot of the ones that are in the seventies compared to today's, you know, flawlessness in some ways, you know, just, just the way that they're done now are a lot better and smoother but it doesn't mean that you guys loved riding those parks any less back then. They weren't perfect, but there is no perfect. It's really about the, the joy of adapting to know that when you're going around a certain pocket, you know to avoid that tile or that portion of the coping because it sticks out just a little bit too far in the wrong place, yeah. but you learn how to ride it. And then when someone else comes, they have to learn how to adapt to that and ride it. That's kind of the joy of going to each different park. They're all a little bit different, challenging, less challenging, whatever it is. And um, I think obviously we want to make them as good as we can, but there is something to be said that a lot of things we see is even renovating uh, projects that are, you know, different skate parks that are already there. Like how can we just renovate it and make some of it even better? Or maybe it's just rough because the construction standards weren't that great 15, 20 years ago. How can we redo that to make it more rideable and still kind of pay homage to the original thought process behind it, but make it way, way better. Kent, Kent and I would also love to see, to add on to your work, since you're already volunteering to solve some problems, here's some more. Um, I would like to see skate parks become more social and embrace the social activities that naturally occur there. They are public parks, they are public spaces, and they should invite the public to engage. And the public is more than skateboarders and scooters and BMX riders. So there's that, and I don't think that skate parks, not due to efforts of New Line or anybody else, because there's some wonderful skate park designers out there killing it, but there's a lot who are not paying attention to these things too. And they're creating spaces that actually work against the social benefits and they become anti-social spaces. And that's where you learn to go to smoke pot or whatever. And, and there's lots of skate parks like that. And I don't want to sugarcoat it because of poor decisions about siding and things like that. And all of the paths that are leading to those skate parks as good as they are or not as good as they are which is a nice intersection for this transportation. How do they get there? They are social, they need nodes, they need access. All of those things are connected, but skateboarders are most focus, focused on whether it's the nine stair or the 10 stair. And really there's a lot more work to do. Yeah, it's um, the design I always say is a, can be the smallest portion of it sometimes. It's really about a lot of what he's saying is making a successful park based off input from everybody you know some people are talking about well where's the restroom where is a drink where's a drinking fountain i mean my wife when she started coming with me to the skate parks where am i supposed to sit where is the shade i'm burning out here or even the <laughs> skateboarders themselves you know when we're taking a time out and trying to like take a break from the action where are we going to hang out where are we going to stand standing room and sitting space is so underrated and it is, you're, you're trying to create a successful social environment where you don't want to feel like you're checking in and checking out like the gym. You want to be able to hang out there and eat, having picnics, whatever it is, and feel like it's somewhere you belong, uh, like you were saying with your friends. It's, the social connection is huge. 
Um, but yeah, there's the fight we fight is, is mostly education. We don't do this because of this. We don't need the 10 foot fence with the barbed wire, which believe it or not has come up. Um, Howie Park used to uh, yeah. make you scan your thumb. Right. Fingerprint you. Yeah, so they sometimes, like I said, they make it so difficult for you to want to go to the skate park. That's why a lot of people don't go because they don't feel like it's made for them. It doesn't really fit their agenda or what they like to do at, at that kind of place. So they're just going to keep going into the streets because you're not really listening to what they want. And that's why I still enjoy skateboarding as much as I did when I started because I like going out there, getting into the trenches with the kids, skating with them and listening to everybody and it's multi-generational it's not just for little kids it's for old young and like we talked about before everyone's riding together fathers sons uh mothers daughters it's it's multi-gender it's multi-generational it's well, really I bigger on yeah. the generational standpoint i think one of the solutions to this is there's a generation in power right now the average city council members probably in their 60s or 70s they didn't grow up skateboarding they didn't understand it they didn't have their summer of fun skateboarding in 95 or something so as my generation and gen xers take those position of powers when the skateboarder advocates walk up to them they're going to understand it from a more uh from that point of view of actually lived it i think the fact that that the older generation had a oh let's put the skaters out near the sewage treatment plant or something and it's i think we want, you know, my view of the perfect skate park is Macball, which isn't even a skate park. It's a museum of art in Barcelona. It's got a ledge, it's got cafes there. You have vendors, like you can hang out there all day long. All day long. And that's my vision of what skate parks will be. Well, and it goes into what you would probably chime into is that's front, center, it's visible, and it's like interwoven and integrated into the fabric of the culture around it. It's not behind an industrial plant hidden out of sight out of mind yeah. that's where you have crime drugs that's a very unsuccessful skate park project yeah i think it becomes a, a an issue in some of it is in the nomenclature i think we need to be thinking more broadly beyond skate parks maybe we should be thinking about skate plazas or yeah. skate civic centers um and then the the second piece to that is how you can start to connect all of those so that these are not just isolated opportunities that might be uh plopped into our city, but how can those be linked together and connected? And that's where you can start thinking about streets for people as opposed to roads for cars. And I think that there's actually a great <laughs> opportunity that we have. <laughs> I, I think that there's a great opportunity that we have in the next 20 years. I think there's going to be a transformation that's going to occur in our cities with uh, entities like Uber and Lyft and with autonomous vehicles coming along we're not going to see a decrease in cars but we're going to see a decrease in parked cars in our cities where at any point in time 90 percent of all of our vehicles are sitting parked somewhere a lot of those are going to start to disappear and what that's going to do is open up the opportunity where most of our streets have on-street parking of taking that parking off and using that space for something else and we really need to be i think out there being an advocate for that uh that being given to the skateboarders, the, 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 the bicyclists, the, the inline skaters, as opposed to another lane of traffic. And th then if you can start to use that land, that's where you can start to connect the various opportunities where you can connect neighborhoods or you can be encouraging all these additional modes of transit to get around. I mean, one thing he's, one thing he's hitting on really is just the opportunity to get people active and recreating instead of being indoors and playing video games all day. I mean, it is fun, but it's, um, you know, like the waterfront park here in San Diego, San Diego, you know, you're basically removing an entire sea of parking lot. You're putting it underground and you're placing it with a huge park with fountains and you see people out there having festivals, music, culture, people being active and enjoying the outdoors. That's really what it's all about. And almost 99% uh, of our projects are public. So it's, it's, it falls into park and recreation. Um, it ties in very well with landscape architecture and how you integrate that into other open spaces. So, you know, you're right, the, the movement of removing a lot of uh, parking and places that you're just using for parked cars and vehicles are being replaced with the opportunity to, I mean, one of the big things we've all talked about too is you don't really have to have this big one monster regional skate park. It's about creating a master plan network 
of different spots in different neighborhoods because not every kid's going to make it to, to the big, super big skate park that's 30 minutes away. So if you can have a network and a master plan uh, where you can ride to, bike to, and get to these different places, that's really the future of, of where that's going to be successful for the whole city, not just one part of the city. And one of the big things we see is every neighborhood needs one, not just the one with a lot of money. And Peter, I mean, you might just roll right into even some of your grants require you to not necessarily be the most affluent neighborhood. It's really encouraging the neighborhoods that need public recreation the most to have the opportunity to have kids to get their hands on a skateboard. Tony Hawk Foundation is a grant maker for skate park construction. And uh, I think we're about $9 million now for maybe 600 projects or so, all 50 states. So uh, we have a lot of skate parks out there done, but our eligibility requirements, I mean, aside from like income and things, we want those skate parks to be concrete and permanent and designed and built by qualified professionals. Because we know that the that whatever it is that ends up being there is going to be there in a landmark and a, and a memory maker for that community for 10 years or more, 15, 20 years. So we, we should do it right. And doing it right isn't that hard. It's just an intention. So you need to learn the questions to ask and then go ask them. When I was starting out as an advocate, I lifted a lot of material from new urbanists out there looking at the way that streets operate, the health of cities and the health of communities, why walking is so important, why hanging out in the front yard is so much more beneficial to your neighbors than hanging out in the backyard. Like there's lots of little things that we can do that are design intentions that can be built around skateboarding because we know that skateboarders are tenacious and will go anywhere. So we can just put the thing that they want to skate on where we want them. And then we could just do that a million times. And then we get a bunch of happy kids and we get a lot of places to skate. I mean, and going back to what you were talking about, the way we um, think about it, programming it to be inclusive, but also not necessarily always calling it a skate park. A lot of times they do call it a skate plaza. The Encinitas Park was only supposed to be 13,000 square feet of skate park. That's what the EIR master plan approved. But when we said, well, what if we have the bowl and the banks and everything else be considered the skate park and we'll have this barrier-free, ADA accessible, uh, somewhat, scale down less is more plaza that you can just legally ride in we'll just call it a wheel friendly plaza we won't call it a skate park and that's how that went from 13,000 to 34,000 square feet because you're thinking about it in a different a different context Perfect. well you guys have been really great because you guys kind of anticipated all my questions <laughs> so now i want to uh throw it out to the audience if anyone has any questions for this group um don't be shy come up to the mic and uh ask for a skate park to be built in your backyard. <laughs> a lot, there's, there's a lot of advocates out here who are working on projects right now. And I don't know, Kiko might come up to the mic too, but I mean, talking about putting them into places, definitely talk about that. Yeah. Well, can you, yeah. Uh, hey, what's going on? Um, so my question, I guess I have a couple questions. Um, have you ever had a disagreement with um, city ordinances, officials, or guidelines when building these skate parks? Um, did it involve some sort of compromise or policy change? And how do you navigate that conversation? I have that problem now. Um, every day. Yeah. <laughs> NIMBYs. Uh, like, like I said, our job is not just about the design. It's about the process to get there. And, and one thing I will, we guys talked about earlier that I liked on the previous conversation was, you know, what have we learned from skateboarding? It's about being persistent, adapting, and you know, one of the things is just educating people on the, the process to get there. And just like in skateboarding, there's a process to learn a trick. There's a process to get the skate park done from A to Z. And it's really all about education. And even in the city of San Diego, even as of last year, um, Alec is in the crowd and some other people and Mickey have, I've had to call Mickey 911. Mickey, I'm in a meeting. <laughs> you need to come now, it's a bloodbath. They don't get it. We need reinforcements and statistics immediately, you know, because, because they just, they need to hear from more than just us. We're just a consultant that is trying to help push forward the project, but they need to hear from people like you guys who actually are, you're the community. So you need to hear from the community, know this is what we need. And that's why a lot of times I put them back into the hands of 
you know, organizations that are, you know, neutral and just there to educate and provide the materials and the tools for you guys to go successfully advocate for the skate park. So it's all about, you know, helping them understand why. And we have to use a lot of case studies. This is what we did here. And this is what they wanted to do. It didn't work. So we're trying to help you not make the same mistakes over and over again. And unfortunately, living here in the city of San Diego, having done so many skate parks, even as of last year, when we were working on the Linda Vista and the City Heights project at the same time, they still weren't getting it, believe it or not. In 2018, whenever, whatever it was, they still wanted to revert back to, no, we're not going to um, put these kind of, we're not gonna change these ordinances in our city code. So we're just gonna open the door to any contractor to come in and build this. And I was like, how many times do we make the same mistake? when every other, sing, every other agency is not doing that, they're allowing us to put in the tolerances required to make a good functional and safe skate park. And at that time, the city of Carlsbad had done it, city of Encinitas had already done it. And so we had to use even the surrounding agencies as examples of what to do and what not to do to advocate for them to help us put in the right specifications to build a quality skate park. So it's, it's a never ending battle. And when, you know, we had, you know, him talking about the projects in Louisiana and other areas, they don't have all the skate parks we have here. So there's not a lot of precedence. They're looking around going, we don't see any examples around here and we're not going to go fly to one. So we have to bring all that information to them. And it sometimes it takes two, three meetings. Sometimes it takes one meeting. It, it just depends on, are they open to listening to what the people are really wanting and asking for? There are a lot of obstacles in this process, and that's a, a spe there's a whole spectrum of obstacles that come from cultural factors about what people perceive skateboarders to be. But then there's policy things. In New York City, they have a three-foot rule yeah. where they consider skate parks playgrounds, so all the elements are three feet or less because that's a falling mm. limitation for kids on swings. Yep, so, it's, and it's still in place. Yeah. yeah. The only reason why you see the bigger bulls and bigger obstacles in some New York parks is because it's done by a private, it's, it's done by the Hudson River Trust. I'm from New York City. That's yeah. how I'm speaking to New yeah, York so, City specifically. Yeah, so Pier 62 happened because it was a Hudson River Trust. Tribeca happened from Hudson, I, I worked on those projects. That's my local, that's my local park. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, it's, it's, it's different for every agency. And in Minnesota, they still have a height restriction. It went from four to six. And sometimes we have to be very creative on how we get them a little bit bigger. Oh, you know, we're measuring from the backside or we're, you know, we're doing an, exten we're, we're doing an extension yeah, so that this, the, the extension creates a, a barrier for safety. So we will get it a little bit higher. I mean, there's certain things we do to try to be creative to make them bigger and better, but it, it is a challenge. And, and there are people here in the County of San Diego who have changed policies because they, they fought and went all the way to the top all the way to Sacramento to, you know, where it matters and get those laws changed. It does happen. And it has happened through skate park projects. And the Lakeside one is a perfect example. I hate to end the fun, but I think we have time for uh, one more question. I got to see some so other I, people lining up yeah, there. So go ahead, yeah, yeah. jump so in. I just want to uh, rock, paper, scissors Sorry. or something back there. <laughs> hey, how's it going, you guys? Um, first off, thank you for, for putting this on for, you know, San Diego. That's, that's really huge. Um, so I'm the chairman of the Spring Valley Skate Park, and uh, the, the question that I have for, for all you guys is, uh, we've, we've been going for about a, a good year, but we have some, some really great support from some like OG skateboarders, because there used to be a skateboard heaven back in 1977 to 79, and um, so... Uh, reading your, your book, The Development Guide, there's like a phase one, phase two, and right now they have a location set for us. Uh, great piece of land. So we'd love to build there. But uh, after that, We're yeah, yeah, we are. no, definitely, for sure, as, as many people possible, please. But uh, we'd love to, to get that original spot that was on Sweetwater Road like as close as possible and and they have like a couple locations for us but just like basketball courts and everything else how do we get skate dots and skate spots within you know a, a city it, it just starts with one so 
for Spring Valley to bring skateboarding back to Spring Valley, if they're open to putting one in that area they have designated, then you know embrace that because that's what they're willing to do now or that's what they're comfortable doing. And then once that's in, then hopefully you can advocate for it. Because just because Spring Valley has one skate park doesn't mean that should be the only skate park. Right, right. As you well know, there's plenty of basketball courts and tennis courts. So there's no reason why you can't use that as a start jump off point to maybe do more. And you just have to kind of work within what they're maybe comfortable with doing at that time. I'm going to throw out cool, an cool. idea that my dad's going to throw back at me later tonight. But um, you ever thought of running for city council? Do you keep saying they, like you could be them, you know, you have an idea, you have a platform, you yeah, know, like, yeah. I just want to throw that one out there. Thank you. Uh, Thank you guys. Thank you guys. <laughs> and, and that has happened um, in St. Cloud, Minnesota. Um, there was a little kid, 13 years old, Austin Lee, who actually did get on the board and helped to make decisions because he was so adamant about trying to be a part of the process and not just be on the sidelines. So he actually did join and was the youngest member of the board and to help help be a voter. And it wasn't just about just the skate park, it was about the community as a whole. But I think that helped get that, get that to happen and educate everyone on why. It's always the why. Well, why do you need it? Why do you want it? Why skateboarders? Why here? Why now? And if you can be involved with the process like that, that, that does help to join. That, you know, maybe it's not the council, maybe it's just some kind of board parks of some rec, kind. Right. Most cities have a parks and rec right. board yeah. commission. We're good. First of all, hit us up, write to Alec or I, and we're going to be, we'll chop it all up. Cool, but let's go. The, I think that there's a couple of different ways to go about it. For, first, you're going to do everything one at a time, right? You're going to do one skate park at a time. You're going to do one spot. You're going to overturn one ordinance. You're going to liberate one bike lane for skateboarders. You're going to, it's always these baby steps that grow into something massive. Then suddenly you have like Skateland USA. But it's, it doesn't, you don't start with the utopia and, and pitch the utopia. Right, you yeah. pitch the little thing. Like, what, if, what happens if we get rid of these skate stoppers? So in my, in my hometown, we had a spot, S Sledges. S Sledges got knobbed, get tickets. You go down to S Sledges, and there's broken glass and graffiti and fast food wrappers because skaters mm -hmm. aren't there kicking that stuff out of the way. We went to the city. Can we take the knobs off? That he said, yeah, okay, we take the knobs off and now it's pristine. So the skaters, right, are creating a win-win, denobbing and liberating a spot that the city is like, dude, now we don't got to clean up all the stuff that was down there because the skaters are kicking it out of the way. Mm. So there's some ways that you can kind of work some sweet spots and develop some credibility in your community by creating small wins where everybody's kind of stoked on. And then pretty soon they're like, got a park commission position. Or you, you know, your name on it. Well, I don't want to end the fun, but don't, I want to don't make take the park commission position. Uh, <laughs> appreciate it. Miserable. Thank you, guys. Thank you so much. <laughs> I want to, before we get kicked out of the room, I want to have some time for everyone to mingle and meet each other. But I want to bring up Lisa real quick to uh, do our little outro. But thank you guys so much for, and thank you thank all you. for coming. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So I just want to thank all of you for coming, but I really want to thank Aliasha Worka more. He posted something that triggered a thought. So I called Peter. He got all excited. Then Ali went to a skate meet and met up with Keegan. Keegan got all excited. And then this is the result. So this is what happens when you work with skateboarders. They think, they, they move, they flow. And what I did see, uh, which was pretty amazing, is that Skateboarders are very much like architectural uh, designers, designers, but I also feel that there is a promise of creating a new city when you recruit skateboarders into architecture because they intimately know the sidewalks, they intimately know the problem areas, they intimately know uh, the kickback that they get from uh, city policy. And what happens, what a lot of people don't know is that architecture isn't just about building buildings. It's about building community and building a civic engagement and process to have a better process to, for people to live within. And so all of this was triggered by all the conversations that we've been having in the last month or two. I mean, it's been, I've never had so many emails in my life. I think my <laughs> eyes got ready to explode. 
But uh, I hope that you'll uh, take a look into architecture, take a look at getting involved in the civic engagement process. We've had graduates from this school that are now part of our civic engagement and part of policy making, and it helps make things move faster. Uh, you can make a, a lot of change. It's not about voting to vote or not vote. It's whether to run or not run. Uh, so really, <laughs> Um, you know, you guys are great. I mean, skateboarding is amazing. We tried to get a woman on the panel, but she's too busy. She's competing right now. She's also an architect. She went to MIT. So we really tried, but really she was too much going on. Um, if you have any questions, um, feel free to contact us. So not only do I do this, but I'm the director of career and alumni services. I employ the grads when they get out of school. I work and teach. I teach the portfolio and resume development class and help teach the students how to inter integrate and mingle and socialize and make connections. And this is just one way. So thank you for coming out. Um, if you're interested in going to school, we have an 89% employment rate. And I am very big on finding the highest level of dollar and teaching you how to negotiate for it. So ask oh. me questions if you want to. <laughs> Canton was going to point out too that this world needs skate park designers. Yes. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I mean, just civic engagement. I just came back from Barcelona, Granada, uh, Sevilla, and Madrid. And the one thing that Spain has is civic engagement, pedestrian cities where cars are not allowed in, small, beautiful, winding streets, and siestas where you can go have a beer with friends and family, and lots of skateboards. So. Uh, one thing that I also have seen on this campus is when I first started working here is all of a sudden we'd have Saudi Arabian students show up, we'd have Spanish students show up, and pretty soon they're riding up. And pretty soon City College, all the skateboards are riding down the street when schools are let out. So it's already happening here and I think what's beautiful about this campus is we're right in the intersection of the downtown area up to the Hillcrest area into Barrio Logan, and there's a lot of crisscrossing happening. Um, we also put on events where we involve, we get involved with community development. We had uh, the government involved with uh, looking at how we could develop uh, a more engaged city environment in, in East Village. And we have, you know, civic, we had uh, uh, architects, city planners, uh, city council people, uh, community leaders all in this room sitting down and having a dialogue and this dialogue tonight is another uh, example of what happens when you take a, a, a juxtaposing ideas and you mix communities that don't normally mix you find that there's a common place that can really happen so I, I thank you for all coming and go out and make this world wonderful so thank you <laughs>